You too, Brad Phillips. We have a box here, and it's kind of a huge box for what it is, which is kind of interesting. So you already know what it is from the title, but this is the Erratics, which is a flap foamy, 860 millimeters, but look how big this box is. This box is like over a meter. I don't really understand it. So we're gonna find out, but that means there's less assembly. Yes! Yes. Love it. Okay, so here we go. I gotta cut both ends. So guys, if you are new to the channel, this is Brian Phillips RC. I'm Brian Phillips, the camera crew is my wife, Megan. She has a name, that's right. I do. <laughs> and she is really good with the camera, so hopefully you guys will enjoy this. This is the unbox, build radio setup portion of the video. You may have already seen the flight. We try to publish at the same times, and here it comes, guys. What is that? It looks totally cool. I can't even see it yet. Wowzers, it's amazing. That looks pretty cool, actually. Okay, so basically the, the concept here is, you know, this is, this is like a 3D experience, but you don't have to fly them 3D. They're super light. Here, I'll give you another shot so you can kind of see what's going on here. And these kits, you can build them yourself, but they're a lot of work to actually do. And by the time you build them, they end up being quite expensive. So the whole thinking, I believe, on this one was we're just gonna make a bind and fly, which is pretty sweet. So bind and fly just means you set up your transmitter like this. We're gonna show how to do it with the NX8. And then you get yourself your own battery. This is called a bind and fly basic to be specific. I believe this is the right battery. It comes with, oh, powerful 3S compatible brushless motor. Oh, not put, that one. Put the wrong box out. So it comes, this thing will receive your battery and it's got everything else in it. In fact, it uses a super small battery. See, look, I was gonna say, there's no way we need a 2200 oh, like, for this. Where's the battery gonna go? <laughs> yeah, okay. exactly, it's got super it. dinky. Yeah. Okay, so this thing supposedly has a 3S uh, brushless motor. It's got smart technology, which is super cool. Avian ESC, which is really neat. I don't know if we're gonna get thrust reverse or not. Factory installed servos and linkages. And then basically, all you have to do is set up the radio, which we'll show you how to do it. Now, they always talk about that like it's no big deal. And there are some profiles that you can download for your transmitter, but I'd highly recommend that you walk through the process with us if you're new to flying radio controlled airplane. Now, just to be clear, they actually quote this as being flat foamy airplane for intermediate to experienced pilots. So I don't know if that means it's, they don't even have a number on this nope, one. It's a two. Oh, it is a two, sorry. So generally with bind and flies, they start with two and two is kind of a broad range. Just like most pilots can handle a two. If you're a pilot already, if you're a brand new pilot, you may not want to get a two for two or three planes. And we can share a link of a bunch of basic beginner planes. And by the way, when you're learning to fly, there's nothing really basic or beginner about beginner planes. You <laughs> think they are because you don't know any better. Once you get them in the air, you'll understand why. They're just a lot easier to fly. And when you're new to the RC piloting business, you won't think there's a difference and there's a huge difference. So this thing's gonna be a different thing for us. Wow, that is a weird box. The main, yep. Look at the way it's packed. That is super weird. We are not used to seeing boxes like this. I'm just gonna pack this back up real quick and throw it behind us so we can see it if we need to refer back to the box. But show the people how it's packed in there. And then there is a manual on my side, not folded. Thank you, Horizon. It's like, it's just a different so package. Weird. I mean, we've, we've never seen one like this. So everything from Horizon usually comes well packaged. So some of you might be thinking, you know, this unboxing is really unnecessary and, and you'd be right. I think so. Um, but a lot of people love unboxing. So we do them. Okay. So there's a bag, it's got a prop in it, a couple carbon fiber wing joiners or spars. And uh, looks like probably winglets. Here's an O-ring. Uh, a couple of screws in each of those bags. And we try to kind of start with the easy stuff so we don't miss anything. So I'm gonna just cut free the manual here. It's of course just taped to the back side or the side of the foam here. So the erratics. Now one of the reasons why you like working with a company like Horizon Hobby over the other competitive brands, this is an E-Flight, one of their kind of flagship brands from Horizon Hobby, is they have these manuals that are set up in a similar and very easy to read fashion. Sorry, I'm kind of blocking the page here. It's 34 inches, wingspan are 863.5 millimeters. But 3D planes tend to be a little bit longer. Okay, so this is where 
if you were going to be doing a plug and play, they would suggest an 830, which is probably a good idea because you've got an open prop design here and you don't want to have the antenna getting caught up in there. And then the battery goes over here. This is where they talk about the battery. But do they say what size? 3S 50C, 600 milliamp hour? What the heck? That's a weird size. I don't even know if we have one of those. Well, we might have to get a little creative. But either way, this is gonna show you exactly how to assemble it. We're not gonna go through that entire manual, but we do like to point out the fact that the manuals are second to none when it comes to the E-Flight products, especially if you're newer in the hobby. And obviously these videos are helpful, but we refer to the manuals. And believe me, when we don't get the manuals, it's frustrating for us because we don't generally know what the settings are. But we do some of that stuff on our own subjective way. And you might wanna do it the same way. Now also we don't collapse the planes, so we don't generally cut them open in a way that's gonna be resealable. But some of you guys might actually want to keep the packaging so you can put your planes away. Generally, we don't do that, so we don't really worry about it. Now, this is just a different opening process than we've ever done, too. So there's a couple of pieces in there, and that's why I'm being careful. Oh, it's the landing gear. Okay, so oh, these okay. are like a simulated wheel pant here, and then, of course, ultralight landing gear. Can't really see exactly the best way to take those out unless just pull them out of the tape, maybe. I wanna be careful, because some of this stuff is delicate and other parts are not really super delicate. So if you guys are new to the channel though, one thing that you're gonna see here on this channel that we do that's a little bit different than our competitors is that we show the entire process in real time with the exception of, you know, the doorbell rings or I have to take a phone call or some, you know, minor interruption for two or three days because we got called away, family plans, <laughs> things like that. But generally speaking, we have unedited videos. Might clip together a couple of short clips together, but it's usually unedited. There's a little machine spot here and then machined milled on the ends, so it slides in easy, that's pretty cool. And then of course, this is carbon fiber tube. It's very sturdy, but also very, very, very light. Okay, let's get the landing gear. This is like a weird box though, I gotta mm -hmm. say. Um, okay, so then we get the horizontal stabilizer and elevator here. Okay, so we got carbon fiber reinforcements. This part is a horizontal stabilizer and the rest is the elevator. Looks like a cutaway hinge with reinforced, did they put a glue joint down there? It's kind of hard to tell. I'm gonna exercise this a little bit. Just let that go. So as you can see, it's got a huge amount of throw on it, which is customary for 3D planes. And if you're new to the hobby and you're thinking about maybe starting with a plane like this, I would highly recommend against it. And we'll give you some examples of why not as we kind of go through this build. See that control surface? That is crazy. <laughs> this is huge. So this is the erratics. Now this comes with this, it's almost like a, like a printed hard plastic. Oh. Almost like you would get on, you know, like a sign or mm -hmm. something, you know, like at a, I'm, I'm thinking of a sign that you would see like with a stand up, you know, where you would stand behind it and take your picture. That's what it feels like, but it's not just paper and it's certainly not plastic. So it's a very light, but it's very sturdy. So we'll see how that holds up. Um, obviously a lot of carbon fiber on here. So we have carbon fiber here. We have carbon fiber here. I don't know if that's carbon fiber. That's just plastic. Then we have carbon fiber here. And I think I might've pointed that one out twice, but yeah, then there's, this is actually a, a tube hmm. and then whatever this is. So that must be where it mounts to the fuselage. And this is actually the wing surface. And this is the control surface as part of the wing. Okay. Now just looking down in here. The whole fuse just lifts right out. Oh, wow. Okay. So that is surprisingly heavy for being what it is. And then as you can see, the ER630, which is just like the 631, it just doesn't have an antenna that's external. The antenna is actually a trace on the back side of the board there. Small brushless motor, 14 pole, 2405, 1200 kV. SPMX AM2300 Avian, okay. Huge servos, look at that weird control horn. Very different design look. 
And you know what that's for? That is a singular servo for both ailerons, isn't it? Oh. Mm -hmm. That is unusual. Today's RC planes don't generally. And then we have an IC2. Ugh. I don't like that at all. And then the Avian ESC is inside of there. Wow. Yeah. So it's just a definitely a different setup than we've ever seen, you and I, Megan. Mm -hmm. And this is, of course, already attached and ready to go. Very heavy duty control linkages for being super ultralight carbon fiber connections. That's very interesting. And look how long the lever arm is on this. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. So we'll see, I don't know. This is not something that I've gotten into in the past, guys. So I gotta be a, uh, totally frank with you. I don't know much about 3D flying because I don't do it as one of my primary um, you know, attributes as an RC pilot. I have an appreciation for it, but I don't necessarily do it a lot. Also, you see that down there? There oh, is yeah. a, I think that's actually the wing joiner there. Don't forget it. Okay, so that must go between the left and the right wing. And just, it's, it's like so nothing. Small. It's like no weight. It's crazy. So I guess at this point, depending on how hard it is to build, it might make sense to leave this all together, um, you know, as, as a carrier. I'm not sure if you're gonna take this thing apart. It can't be that big of a plane at 850 millimeters. Mm -mm. But for some of you, you're gonna need to take it apart just because you don't have necessarily the real estate for parking your planes. And that's one of the big advantages we have here is that we've got room to park them. Well, sort of. Uh, that seems to be getting smaller and smaller every day. But the build process of this should go pretty smooth. So we're gonna do it right now, but we're gonna pause and come right back. All right, so I wanna put the landing gear in first, even though they show it on like step three. And that's because I want somewhere to lay things. So it's just a square tube, it slides in, it slides in past and then goes up to this and then it snaps in. So just one word of warning, they, they snap in hard. And if you slide your hands on this wrong and you get a sliver of carbon fiber, you're gonna be hating life because it hurts bad if that happens. So make sure you put it in the right direction. And if you're not sure, wear gloves, okay? Carbon fiber is uh, generally not a big deal, but if you can have your hand behind the foam, that'll protect it too. It's just that it's not very strong, okay? So I'm not hearing a snapping noise either. Do you hear a snapping noise? I did not. Okay, I didn't hear a snapping noise. So I'm just hoping they're all the way in there. I don't see anything obvious for snapping. So there's our landing gear, pretty simple. There's nothing on the tail, as you can see. It's just a tail dragger, like legitimately dragging Literally. the tail. Okay, so now the second thing we need to do, in our case, is the tail. So the tail feathers, red side goes up. Mm -hmm. And then I wanna, do it the easiest way possible. So I just need to make sure that the control horn is on this side, okay? And I'm not seeing what I'm caught on, but I'm caught on something. Is there some trick to this here, camera crew? It does say from the left to the right, which is what you're doing. Okay. Okay, see how I did that? See how that plastic had to slide around there? That was the first issue I ran into. Now that I'm past that, I should be good to go. It's just this gets in the way of the plastic under here. Now, what else am I caught on? I feel like I'm caught on something else immediately. It's very strange. I'm not used to having to slide these things through here. Oh, it's just there's a vertical piece and it's catching on this opening. There we go. Now we're good. Okay. Pretty simple stuff once you get past those weird spots and just slide this all the way through. And there's kind of a flat here and then an angle, but it's very subtle. The tip is right here. You can see it when you're looking at it from straight down. You can also look at this bracket that lines up. And once your holes are clear and you can see those holes, once you see light poking through these holes, mm -hmm. you can go ahead and pass the screws through. Okay, so we have two machine screws here. They're flat on the tip. The other ones in our kits are gonna be plastic screws like this that are sharp. 
these ones are four, and that's for the main wings, okay? So if you're trying to figure a way to differentiate those, that might help. Okay, two screws, I'm gonna lay one right next to the bag there, so you can help me keep mm -hmm. accountable to that. Okay, so holding with my index finger or middle finger in this case, just drop it down in using a China screwdriver that we got from some other aircraft at some point. Very simple. This is a terrible length screwdriver for this application. So I'm gonna get a different screwdriver. This one's longer, let's hope that works better. And you see how they wanna spin every time? Come close. See how that's a sharp tip and this is a sharp tip? Sometimes we run into this problem and some of the Chinese screwdrivers are better than others, but I have heard from some experienced people that there is also a Japanese tip style that is what we're supposed to be using for these things. And that's why we sometimes struggle to get a bite on certain Phillips screws. But I can tell you right now, it just wants to spin, okay? So that's quite frustrating. I'm gonna pause and get another screwdriver. So I tried a bunch of different screwdrivers and evidently all of ours suck or this thing is just a bad spot. So what I'm trying to do is I'm gonna to try to get this other side in here and the camera crew is gonna to have to move to get to where she can see. I'm trying to hold this without undoing any of the control horns and it's not really hard to start. It's just, there's not that much to hold on to to give back pressure so that you can press hard into the screw. So you see it goes okay if you get a screwdriver that works. So as you can see, but my concern is there's not much to push against back here because what you're holding on to is basically a thin piece of foam backed with another piece of thin foam with some plastic and carbon fiber. So you have to be really careful where you're holding on. And so that's been our problem on these two screws, which seems like such a minor thing and it is really a minor thing. You'll be able to figure it out, but just be careful because if you slip, you'll run that thing right through into your thumb, no less. I mean, it's not like it has to be all the way in there. All it does is pin the wing in place. But you see how it's wanting to slip? And I know how to run a screwdriver. I know it doesn't seem like it <laughs> from looking at me, but uh, I do use screwdrivers. <laughs> okay, so the tail is on. Obviously the elevator servo is not in the neutral position in my opinion, so I'm not gonna even hook that up yet. Mm -hmm. We're just gonna go straight to the main wings which should be relatively easy, okay? There's a carbon fiber spar that slides in. I usually try to slide the spar in first on stuff like this just because it gives me something to hang on to and line up. And you could tell which one's the top because of the print. This is the bottom, this is the top. Okay, so we're gonna slide this through. If I can get it going. Okay, immediately have to eat my words. It's not uncommon. There we go. So I'll try to center it this time. We'll see if that works. It's a tight pocket guys. There's just not much play there. Okay. And then you've got two more screws that go in from the top again. And these screws are which ones? The machine the screws. The machine screws? Yes. Okay. So I can't help but feel a little bit concerned about these screws maybe not going in good like the back ones. And I think it's just got to do with our screwdrivers. So we're gonna have to get some nice Japanese screwdrivers instead of these Phillips ones because they're evidently sending us Japanese screws even though this is all made in China. Which is funny because the Chinese screwdrivers are definitely more like the Phillips tips that we get around here probably because they're all Chinese. Because mm -hmm. a Japanese screwdriver probably costs like two cents more. Probably. I would imagine. Let's see how this goes. Oh, that's going way better. I can put my finger directly below it so I have good backing. See, I just couldn't press the tip in so I couldn't make a good purchase into the Phillips tip. This one's way easier. Okay, good. Because there's four of them. Good. Yep. So guys, these builds are pretty simple. I mean, they're hardly builds and we just use the word 
Uh, in a generalization, I mean, everybody knows I'm not building this. It's not like it's a stick built plane. Okay. Stick built plane would be huge time investment. We've never done that on this channel. We've done, the most we've done is like an ARF. And that was enough. Super short and totally. It's really, really hard to do a full length video like this on an ARF. Normally when you see an ARF built on a YouTube channel, it's like time-lapse or ours was time-lapse and it was like an hour and 10 minutes or something still. We would have to put like graduations and Yeah, weddings. we'd have to have weddings <laughs> and funerals in the middle. Okay, so here we go. So basically what we do is we walk you through the process if you're new to the channel and we show you each step because some of these steps are harder than they want you to believe. It's not because they're trying to hide behind difficult assemblies. It's just very easy when you're making a marketing video to just kind of gloss over some of the negative things. And they tend to uh, come out when you're doing long format. And so for that reason, a lot of people come to Brian Phillips RC before they make a purchasing decision on planes. They wanna make sure it's not a turd with some lipstick on. All right, good. All right, so we have the control surfaces to still fix. And I'm just thinking to myself, I don't remember seeing control rods, but you evidently had them in a bag. Okay, cool. Yeah. So the camera crew off camera actually took those out of the bag. I was taking care of the uh, box and stuff. Yes, these were just the pieces wrapped that were foam wrapped on the end. So where do these ones go? Those are for the side force generators on the wings those are gonna install and attach to those little black brackets. Side force generators? These. I'm saying, what are these for? That. That's a side force generator? Mm -hmm. That's an optional wing strut, Megan. Oh, what's this? Oh, that's these. Yeah, I already I knew, knew what oh, that sorry. was. I was mm -hmm. just trying to understand what I needed the screws for. Okay, so let's okay. talk about these. These are side force generators, which is basically like a horizontal, or excuse me, like a vertical stabilizer on the wing, okay? So you'll find these on 3D planes. So the bigger ones go on the inboard portion. So you kind of just twist them or whatever it takes to get them back there. And this says right, okay? It says R. So right hand, if you were sitting in the pilot's seat. So I'm just kind of bend it a little bit like this, try to minimize as much as I have to bend it and just slip it back until we get to the point where we can get it to pop into position. And then there's a little, little key that pops down front and back like this. Oh boy. Boy, I can't figure out why. Oh, there we go. Okay. So now that's in. Once that's in, there is a mount here for the wing strut. Okay. That's on the bottom. Okay. So you might as well get both of these done. So I believe the red goes up and the gray goes down. So this is the outboard portion. Now these are optional. You don't have to put these on, but I would recommend them because they're gonna help you with uh, better sustained knife edges and things like that. Things where you're actually flying sideways. And so I'm excited to try it because I've never really done 3D flying in this way. I mean, we've done some planes that are capable of some 3D, but we've not really gotten into it much. Okay, so this says L, as in left. I'm gonna open this up and slip it back. I must say, this is, this is more awkward than I thought. I need a, an extra hand holding that, please. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. So those just slide in. There's really nothing to it. It's, it's not an especially difficult thing. I just want to be real careful not to break this because once it's broken, I don't think it's going to be real easy to get going straight. Okay. So that's in. All right. So pretty simplistic operation there. Now it's just a matter of getting the control arms installed. Okay. What are we supposed to do with these? What hole do we go into? The outside hole, okay? Mm -hmm. And then on the aileron, where do they go? On the outside of both the aileron and both, the control yeah. arm. 
So the control arm is going to insert from the top or the bottom? Obviously from the top, because I don't think we'll be able to get them from the bottom. And then that's going to go to the top, but I don't know if that's in the right position yet. So we want to know that it's centered first. So I'll go ahead and wait until we're done with our radio setup to actually terminate that with the clevis, okay? And then I also want the wing strut because that definitely has a lot more flapping than I would want on an airplane. So normally we would use a plate stand, but this thing kind of stands on itself. Okay, so this is the optional wing struts. As you can see, it's like a, almost like a turnbuckle design because there is a screw that comes out the end. So it's a lot like a regular control surface linkage. And the way that works is it goes through here and I'd like to be able to put the screwdriver in from this side, okay? And then you can line that up with whichever hole they would suggest the outside hole, I would they imagine. They suggested the second hole from the outside actually. Okay, well, that's fine. But you can adjust the dihedral somewhat as well, then it looks like. Mm. So I'm going to bring these both. Let's see how they slide on first. See, the problem is, okay, so once you screw this in, then you can make your adjustments, I guess. Because oh. how else are you going to do it? Yeah. Okay, so there's four screws for this, and these screws are the ones that have tips. They're the only ones in the kit that have it. A sharp tip because they're going into plastic. Okay, so I'm just gonna. This is kind of a tight spot to run a screwdriver, too. That just went inside of the plane. So I'll have to work on that here in a minute. Oh, and by the way, that chirp you heard was from one of our chargers charging the 850 milliamp 3S batteries, which are smart batteries. They are actually smart and they are actually bigger than the recommended size battery on this aircraft. See what I'm talking about being close? Can you see that it's not all the way in? Mm-hmm, I can. Okay, I'm gonna flip this plane up, so. Okay. I need to drop this screw out, you ready? Yep. Goodness gracious, I know I it's on the it. counter. I heard it right here. Okay. Whew, that was close, we almost lost that thing. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna do this other side and then we have to make some length adjustments. Okay, so right here. And this, this is actually just like, there's, there's no, there's hardly any weight to this airplane. It's very strange. Cause every time I'm doing something, you see what I'm talking about? Like stuff like that happens because it's just not very heavy. And so you don't have anything to press against. It's very strange. Like it makes it kind of challenging. A lot easier than building from scratch though, that's for sure. Now, if you look over here with me, I wanna make those wings square if possible. And so what I'm thinking is, do I wanna pull the wing in or, well, see now I lifted that thing. Or do I wanna extend this? Because right now I'm in the second hole, not the third hole. And I honestly don't know if it matters as long as the thing is square. I really, I just don't understand why it would matter. I don't think it matters, I don't okay. care. Well, they are optional, so. Well, they're optional wing struts, but you still need them to do what the wing struts are supposed to do. So what I'm saying is I'm going into the second hole instead of the third hole. Okay. And there is a very minute difference in the amount of leverage that this simple machine can handle. And when I say simple machine, I'm talking about just the lever, not the airplane. But you see, I don't have that control surface attached, so I can push that out of the way as I tighten this. That is nice. Mm-hmm. See, this one's giving me a better opportunity at getting tightened in there, hmm. but I'm still not tightened all the way. So just be aware. It kind of is what it is, I guess, on that. Okay, now I'm going to try to go to the second hole from the end, which means we're technically one hole shy of where we're supposed to be. And the annoying chiming you're hearing in the background, if you guys can hear it on our mics is coming from another charger. So I have four of those batteries cooking, ready to go. And uh, Mother Nature is blowing. Yeah. See, I, I, can't, I can't turn it anymore. Just it is what it is. It's only gonna get several threads in there. And to be frank, it probably doesn't matter because just the nature of those screws, just, they're bottoming out in this plastic housing. So it's not gonna matter. Yeah, that looks pretty good. I think we're good there. 
Okay, so now the next big thing we have to do before we can actually get this set up would be to put the prop on, except this would be a step you would skip until you're ready uh, for safety reasons. And guys, as you know, there's two things in this hobby that can get you hurt by, I mean, the general thinking is props and lipos. So this is a 946, okay, you can tell by that. And again, if you're relatively new to the hobby, still remember that goes forward on a tractor aircraft. And you notice these two screws here on this avian motor. So what you do is you slide that prop on and it just goes on there and it's got a little bit of wiggle, which I'm not kind of surprised that's the way that goes. And then this thing just gets pulled tight and that's what holds your prop on. So what I'm gonna do is I need to pull kind of hard and then if you're having trouble getting that, which I did get mine on the first go around, so I was pretty fortunate there. What you can do is you can take a screwdriver like this and you can do the same operation, only lay this into the screw head, okay? And then just walk it up until it slips in. Okay, I don't wanna take mine off because I feel like I got super lucky to get it on the first crack. Um, okay, so the next step will be to set up the model. So we're gonna clean up screwdrivers and come right back. Okay, so obviously when you're charging this battery, if you're gonna use the battery we're using, this is Gen 2 850 milliamp. Case in point why I don't like putting Velcro on batteries, it's in the wrong spot on this battery, okay? Look, Velcro and Velcro, and it just looks terrible. So really what I'd prefer to do is make a Velcro strap for an appropriate plane, put it on the plane, and then just leave it with the plane when I'm not using it, and then when I need it, I grab it and I put the battery in and then install it onto the air aircraft. In this case, this battery has the IC2, which is good. And don't forget, you're gonna need to have some sort of an apparatus to plug it into your charger. So you can plug in like that, and then you can plug this into your smart charger. Okay, now keep in mind, you do need the smart lead. So you can't just take like an old motor and you know steal the ends and make it go into a regular charger. Although you can do that if you do it slow enough. Just don't tell Horizon I told you that. Because technically these things self-balance all the time. So remember, safety first, get this thing, you're gonna use it for other applications. And I have these batteries going. And by the way, this one charged on the S155, that is a great choice. It goes up to 4S, 55 watts, single channel. I would, I would talk you into this first because it's got all the features except for it only goes up to 4S. And then you would probably step up to the S1200 or the S1200, which is gonna give you 200 watts on one channel or the S2200. They also have this in an S1400, I believe, but then not to be confused with, there used to be an S1400. This is actually, as you can see, the S1200. So confusing, right? S1200, like what were they thinking? This is a DC variant, this is an AC variant. They are not the same. This is a Gen 2, that's a Gen 1, but I have updated the firmware. So also I wanna take this second to mention that there is a software update available on the NX lineup, okay? So if you have an NX that hasn't been upgraded for a little bit, you might wanna do that, which I'm only remembering that because I haven't upgraded mine, <laughs> which means that we're gonna to have to stop and upgrade the firmware before we continue because I don't wanna do it wrong. And at the same time, I only tell you that because it's hard to remember. And also don't forget, because I know a lot of you are gonna be like, oh, I can't remember my password to horizonhobby.com. And a lot of you guys are logged in at horizonhobby.com on your browsers, so it's saved or whatever. Well, this is on spectrum.com, okay? So when you have to go there to register your products so you can do all those uploads and stuff, or not uploads, but uh, so you can register this product to yourself, you can actually do a lot of that through the built-in Wi-Fi, but at some point you're gonna be on there and when you need to remember that password, which incidentally is when you get onto this to do your registration, you're gonna remember it as your Spectrum RC. Uh, is it Spectrum RC or Spectrum RC? Is it Spectrum, is it Spectrum.com or Spectrum RC? Oh, that's a good question. Well, anyway, whatever one it is, it's the one, the, just make sure you remember you need to have a different password than the one that you have for your Horizon Hobby. So we're gonna take a quick sec and check our firmware and then come right back for the radio setup. Okay, so I said we were gonna work on updating firmware and stuff and then I was like, oh wait, we gotta do CG. So normally we would take and we would measure to the CG, which is, if you wanna just point that out and read it to him, please. 
Okay, CG location is measured from the leading edge of the wing at the root. 79 millimeters plus or minus seven millimeters. Okay. The recommended CG is 84 millimeters back from the leading edge. Okay, so does somebody want right to explain up. to me exactly what that means? Because 84 is within those boundaries that they mentioned. So 84 is less than 86 and greater than 72. Mm -hmm. Everybody agrees about that, right? Right. But then look at the diagram. The yes. diagram is so ambiguously drawn they're drawing it from the leading edge behind the trail behind this. Right. Like, how are you going to mark your center of gravity way out here? Like, nobody measures out but here. But it puts you it out on the aileron. The right. CG. It puts it back here if you're doing that, which I don't, that's not, that can't be it. So here's what I'm going to suggest you do, okay? Now, I could be wrong, as I often have been, noted by years and thousands of videos. This thing falls right in the range, mm -hmm. okay? So it, it, I'm at 72.5, close enough for what we're doing, right? Look at this. Okay, so from the leading edge, I am just in front of that thing. Now from 86, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm at 86, okay, so there's 86, close enough. Look where that goes, right behind it. So essentially, if you wanna know your CG, just go off of this thing. That's gonna be close enough. It doesn't make that big of a difference. This is a 3D flying plane. You're gonna be basically doing, you know, this sort of thing with your plane, you know? So your CG is gonna be wherever you want it to be uh, within those range. So my suggestion to you is unusually, don't worry so much about the CG on this one, just kind of go off of that thing. Because otherwise I challenge you to measure from here and then go back however far they, like, like is this, is this here, is that, is that uh, two millimeters? Is that supposed to be one millimeter? Is that supposed to be three millimeters back? And I'm probably reading too much into it as usual. But the thing is, why is it so hard to just draw a straight line from the wing root at we the wing like root? Square wing we have root. a perfect square ring root. So I don't understand why they have to make us work on that. So anyway, whoever's drawing up these instructions, please, that would be a good thing to get corrected because it's very challenging for us, we wanna make sure that we show these things uh, with their best foot forward, but then like we don't e e exactly know where the CG is. So on a 3D plane, my experience has been it's not as critical. So just understand that. If you're new to 3D things, 3D flying air airplanes, aircraft, then it's not a huge issue. So anyway, I'm gonna turn on my transmitter. We weren't gonna show this, but we're gonna show it anyway. Okay, so I'm gonna hit back and cancel, or excuse me, actually, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go into click, go into function list, scroll down to system setup, disconnect RF, and then we're gonna go down to system utilities, I think is where it is. System settings. Okay, system settings, okay. That's where you do your legacy keyboard, guys, in extra settings, by the way. Yeah, don't want to do that. About regulatory. Okay, so pause for just a second. Okay, so I have no idea if I can share the serial number of this or not, but there's basically uh, 3.06 for NX8, and then I'm just gonna turn away just a little bit. That's on. And then there's FCC numbers, and then regulatory information for Canada, and I'm just like waiting for it to like pop up some sort of password for my Wi-Fi or whatever, but I don't see it. So I'm at 3.06. My understanding is that's not the latest and greatest anymore. So I think you have to go in through Wi-Fi utilities. So I'm just gonna turn away for just a second and connect to networks. And I'm gonna basically, it says twiddling thumbs, loading, and then I'm gonna click to the correct Wi-Fi network, which you guys don't need to see that. And then I'm gonna click connect and it's connecting. I'm not even gonna show you the SSID because there's no reason for you to see that. It says connecting, it's obtaining IP address. And then it says blue light and continue. Okay, blue light here and continue. So I'm gonna click continue. Okay, now I can log in, register, deregister, check for updates, log out, erase, cred erase credentials. So I'm gonna check for updates I, again, just because I, you know, for security reasons, we're not gonna show that online. So I'm gonna click, it says twiddling thumbs, it says loading, and then it just sits here for a second. And my experience has been, we have Starlink internet here. And so sometimes we do run into um, 
I don't want to call it errors, but it's actually not usually attributed to the transmitter. It's usually attributed to our Wi-Fi because we can actually have system outages on our, our network access without any warning. And it just happens for a few seconds. It might be one second today. It might be, you know, later today, it might be two minutes and two minutes to be on the long side, but you won't know you'll be working on the internet and it will just like stop for a few seconds and then it'll come right back and pretty much where you left off. So one of the big disadvantages to Starlink is that the constellation leaves for gaps in the sky. And so sometimes we get stuck on these steps. So don't hold that against this, but just understand that it is something. Okay, so there's login, register, deregister, check for updates. I'm just gonna try that again. It says twiddling thumbs. My loading screen uh, doesn't seem to be moving though. So that makes me think that maybe it's not loading. You see this, how it's like just stationary. Mm. It doesn't, it's not like alternating the position of these slashes. So there is another way to do software updates if you weren't already aware. And even though the Wi-Fi is by far, in a way, the easiest way to do it, one thing you can do is you can also put them onto your SD card if you use an SD card. And this is just a tip for you guys at home watching. Every once in a while, go ahead and write all your models to your card because like, I, I forget to do it and it's like such a pain to remember if you don't. Um, so I'm not sure if we'll just pause until this thing connects or if we're gonna maybe possibly reset the router for Wi-Fi or what the deal is. But at this point, it's just still twiddling its thumbs. So I'm gonna try to get this thing to wake up and I'll show you what I did. So I just logged out and I'm gonna log back in or attempt to log back in. And now it's gonna, it's gonna ask me to type in my username and password. Yay, that's gonna be fun. This is your Spectrum RC username and password. So just keep in mind if you have to do that, that's what you're doing here. And so because it was jamming up at the twiddling thumbs screen, trying to check for updates, this is why I'm logging out, logging back in. You might wanna try the same, so we'll pause and come back. Okay, so I ended up logging out and logging back in, and then it found the update to 3.07.17, okay? I was at 3.06, I think. So I'm just gonna highlight it and click it, and then it says twiddling thumbs. Don't be alarmed if the graphic doesn't run all the time. It doesn't run all the time. But definitely do, like that's, that's gonna take a little bit of time as you can see. And also I backed up all my models, which takes forever because I have so many of them. And that being said, if you ever trash a transmitter, don't worry, all hope is not lost. There is a second memory card about here, right on the actual main board. So there's two different drive options on these NX lineup. So just be aware if you ever would like run it over with your truck or your car or drop it out of an airplane or something like that, or somebody crashes into it while it's sitting on the bench, then, you know, and it gets destroyed. So, so it's in an unusable state. It's possible that you can, of course, try taking out the drive that you've got there, but you can go inside and take that drive out too in a really bad case. So just be aware there are some backup plans. This is going, uh, at 33 kilobytes per second. So it's not like a really a blazing fast <laughs> speed, but again, don't hold that against Spectrum or against Horizon Hobby because we're using Starlink here. Um, which by the way, we should, while this is going, cause it's taking a while. One thing I could say is Starlink has been great. If you need internet service in your rural, yep. it's a pretty good choice. There's, there's other choices out there, but it's worked well for us. Generally speaking, it's been a lot more reliable than Viasat, which was considerably more expensive, almost twice as expensive. Mm -hmm. And that was about one fifth to one sixth as fast yeah. in, in just download speed. But then the upload speed, it was probably about a hundredth. Well, that's not true. It's about a tenth to a hundredth as fast. So it's, it is a huge de degradation in performance. And it also got knocked out by low level clouds. It got knocked out by heavy fog, it got knocked out with any atmospheric anything. Yeah. Um, whereas Starlink does a better job, even though it's you know tracking the constellation and following, and there's moving parts to fail and all this stuff, it's been very good. So that being said, it's more expensive than when we got it, and by a decent amount, by a few hundred bucks more. So if you're getting the V2 with the oh, smaller for dish. The, yeah, yeah, for the actual dishy, initial setup. Dish you make dish base is more expensive. Yeah. So as you can see, while we've been talking about unrelated items, and guys, this is just kind of what we do on Brian Phillips RC, so hopefully it doesn't off put you too bad. We are in the process of reviewing a new plane, but these are the things that come up. Yep. 
in the general course of the hobby. And so a big part of running this hobby anymore is just understanding that you're gonna have to have a certain technical aptitude and you're gonna have to advance a little bit and build on that and advance a little bit and build on that. And if you're just re returning to the hobby, it's super hard and scary because it's like, there's so many things have changed from back in the Futaba days where we had you know, a crystal that we had to match with the, you know, our transmitter. And, you know, you were talking about four or five, if you're really rich channels, you know, now we're up to eight channels on this, eight full discrete channels, plus tons of switches, tons of telemetry data, which is a whole nother radio system. And then, you know, we could go up to 20 channels on this line and beyond. So it's just, it's a totally different setup. We've got programmable uh, controllers. We've got some with touch screens, some with Android systems in there where they've got cameras that can play music. I mean, it's just insane. These ones are a little bit more limited to the IX line, but we have been in the active pursuance of making a decision between kind of diverting our path of supporting everybody in the NX8 line and supporting people. We're thinking about going to an NX10, which is gonna be considerably similar to this. And this is a really popular size and it's worked for most of the planes. But the thing is we've run out of channels now twice or three times. I think three times. Three so. times. So we're actually kind of kicking ourselves because at this point we need to make the jump to the 10, but I'm reluctant to do it, A. And two, I have an opportunity to potentially do the IX-14. The problem is the IX-14 is gonna be diverting to something that a lot less people use. And so in our, you know, in our pursuit to serve the hobby community the best we can, we understand it's not real practical. Oh, okay, so now it's giving me a new thing. It's not real practical to pick the lesser popular item, even though it's the more complex and I'd be good at, you know, teaching you guys how to use it or working alongside you as we learn how to use it. I feel like the 10 is probably a better option. So just so you guys know, if you've noticed that I have notably not gotten the NX14 yet or the IX14 yet, that's because we're trying to make a decision on what's best for, for you guys and for us. So it's kind of a tough one. So at this point, anyway, so it says download complete file name, blah, blah, blah. And it says install, do not power the radio off during the update process. Please wait at least five minutes before assuming there is a problem. Okay, so the reason I say that is because it goes through this weird like Microsoft style, you know, status bar. Like the status bar goes to the other side, sort of, right? And then it like starts over. And then, but then it goes this way yep. at some point. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Oh, but, oh, it, it died. No, it didn't. It's, it's alive. It's alive. It's like Frankenstein's now. So basically get used to that. That's the way it does it back and forth for um, a while. And if things kind of like stall out, don't worry. You know, it used to be back in the day when we had an operating system showing a status bar, it was like 0% complete, 5% complete, 100% complete, you know, and you could see this like progression through the ranks. Well, now Microsoft is like throwing caution in the winds. We're just like, wow, well, okay, we're just going to go back and forth a bunch of times. You know, you know what? Let's just do some ellipsis. Ellipsis is better. Uh, let's do let's do other icons that nobody understands what they are. And then you get into Android and uh, you know Apple iOS and all these different things. And you know, why don't we have status bars in technology? Like, what would be wrong with just one bar that says status of the complete procedure? <laughs> Guessing, guessing is fun. It's like, it does you no good. It's like, what is the purpose of, what's the, I'm on the fifth bar at, oh, 32%, but then it went to 80. And now we're going backward. So anyway, this is the way the uh, system updates go. But I must say, and I gotta say this, the Spectrum software update has been one of the harder things to do on the NX. Now, when I say harder, I mean frustrating because of our internet connection. I don't know if that's consistent with this or if it's consistent with that, but I can definitely tell you this. I've spent literally years trying to get my stupid garage door openers to work. <laughs> and then randomly one day I get a notification on my phone and I'm like, what the heck is that? My garage door opened. Okay. That's weird. So anyway, that took me literally three years to do. <laughs> sure. And I work in an IT field. So I, I don't know what to say other than the fact that when you're on satellite internet, there are certain things that are not super smooth going and, um, you know, but you, you learn to live with it because we're in a beautiful place and I would rather fight that a little bit than be in town 
and have fast internet and you know have all the other things that go with it. So for now, and as you can see, there's definitely still some signs of life, so there's no problems there. This was a pretty big download and a pretty big update, so I don't know. Might maybe there's gonna while. be maybe there's gonna be new pictures in there. That'd be cool. Maybe it'll set your keyboard back to the new one. No, it's okay. We can switch it. The legacy keyboard's my style. So anyway, guys, we'll come right back. I just wanted to show you the process of updating and it is quite easy. Now, if you do have to go on to spectrumrc.com, you'll have to log in, type in the same credentials that you'd be, to oh, look, and it's back. Okay, cool. Oh, okay. So we're back to the regular screen. Okay, so let's just, first thing I'm gonna do is I am going to power cycle my transmitter. Okay, so I'm just gonna, we were flying the Technum last time. So we're just gonna shut it off, version 3.07, so they don't show the full nomenclature for that. Okay, so the splash screen looks the same, everything comes up the same. Uh, 3.92 volts, that's interesting. I don't remember seeing that in uh, that resolution, so that's kind of cool. Okay, so scrolling through the options, there's not really anything different there. Let's click and just go through. There's supposed to be some audio events, system stuff fixed, some security patchwork, I don't know. We'll find out if there's any difference. But at any rate, now that we have that done, we can just scroll into Where's the new model? Where's, oh, system, system setup. setup. <laughs> Gosh, it's been so long since I did it. I usually hit these two together and go to it. So we're gonna disconnect RF and it shuts that off and then you can go to model select. So I'm gonna click model select and we'll scroll all the way down to the bottom. So as you can see, we have a lot of models in this. We're gonna add a new model. Now you can also go add new bind and fly and you can also just download a model. I don't recommend you do that. Get the use, get the best use of your very expensive tool here. So let's just do add a new model. And this is where you can change from Acro to Heli to Sailplane uh, template by Nifly. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back to Acro and we're gonna create that. Now, if you're wondering how we know to do this, now this will take a few seconds and it'll beep, 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 beep. If you go to this spot, computerized transmitter setup, it's gonna tell you how to do it. Now that's on page four of the manual. And as you can see, this just came back to our system setup. So this tells us where to set up. Now, normally, since this is a 3D plane, I might actually follow the instructions rather than just setting up my normal high and low rates. Hmm. Hmm. Throttle cut to minus 130, come on, man. Okay, so first things first, I'm gonna walk back out. We have Acro. The first thing I always do is set up throttle cut where I usually name it, which actually, why did I not do that this time? Go back down to system setup, disconnect RF, model name. This is where I type in the name. The name of course is the Erratix 3 ff 860 mm So, and they, they mean from FF, that's a flat foam, flat foamy. So I'm gonna type that in, we'll come right back. Okay, so Erratix, 3D FF 860 millimeters. We can walk back out of this menu and then aircraft type, we don't have to mess with pretty much any of this stuff. We'll come back to it later if we need it. So obviously we're not gonna be setting up flap rounds on this plane. There won't be a need for flaps. And also, as you can see, we have one servo. So you can't set up flap rounds with one servo. And uh, you, you, you could probably do it if you wanted to, but it would be totally out of the ordinary for this type of aircraft. Okay, so. As you can see on the computerized transmitter, it says set all transmitter programming to blank. Okay, we already did that. Okay, so aileron door. It's okay. So they want high and low. So 10 and 70. Ugh. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this to switch F. And they want a high and low. You know what? I'm sort of tempted. To, hmm. Yeah, they're saying high is 30 and low is 20 for Expo. So why don't I just do... Can I throw out a weird yeah. suggestion? What if you set E, because you never use switch E, to their recommendation, and then F to like your normal? Mm. Yeah, but this is a different type of plane. And the mm -hmm. thing is they have a high and a low, but not a two setting. Now the reason they have high and low, servo travel to 100%, okay. Why did they say that? That's so weird that they pointed that out here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they, they don't point that out. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set everything to switch F still. So there'll be three settings. And look, there's a gap. See the gap? Yeah. There wasn't a gap there before. 
So that's part of the software update, I believe. Okay, so in the top rate, that's gonna be the most erratic. Okay, so that'd be like zero. Then in the middle rate, I'm gonna set to approximately half of what they call out. But I don't know if I, I kinda want this to be the normal rate. So why don't I just do 15, okay? Or excuse me, the high rates is supposed to be 30% expo on all three, and then low is supposed to be 20. So I want to run at probably 25 and then like 40, okay? And then I'm going to drop my rates down to 70. That's going to be a really crazy difference. So 25, and then I want to set this to like 15. Okay, so we have like a digression into the craziness. Okay. okay. Okay, so it's gonna be like 15, 25, 40 with the rates dropping to 70. Okay, so that's unusual for me to do that. Okay, then for elevator, we're gonna do exactly the same function. And uh, this is basically gonna give us an undershooting target and then we're gonna have the slightly overshot from what they recommend and that's just because of a skill thing for me and a comfort level thing. And you guys may not set it up at all like this and that's okay. Okay, and then same thing, switch F. Whoops, I accidentally switched it to G. You see how that works? If you're selecting the switch and then you accidentally move the scroll bar, it's gonna change which switch until you move the recent switch and acknowledge with press. Hopefully that makes sense. You'll get used to it really quick. It's actually quite intuitive and we have used other transmitter brands and we have not been impressed at all with the intuitive nature of navigating their menus. That's not to say that there's anything wrong with them, it's just definitely not what I'm used to. So that's where we're gonna start. We've got more if we need it, and we have less if we need it. Okay. All right, then throttle cut, of course, is very important. We wanna turn that on with switch H. They call out 130%. Okay, so I'm gonna just move the throttle stick. As you can see, it's down at minus 130. I shut the throttle cut off, it goes to 96. I don't like when they call out at minus 130 because I feel like there is a gray area where the throttle could start between minus 130 and here. So presumably this becomes the full range, this to this, but that the throttle cut could potentially become the bottom of the range, thus making this the perceived output with the throttle cut off. Okay, so I don't like that, but it is what it is. So minus 130, we'll see how that works. Um, and then do they talk about time at all? I don't think they do. Uh, timer is usually one page back, but with the battery. Oh, okay. So I'll be up there if there is. Mm. Oh, they do show 600 to 850 milliamp. Oh, good. Okay, so that's good. So they're recommending a 3S6 600 milliamp hour, which is a strange size. And um, okay, so that's pretty that's simple stuff. Okay, so now what we need to do is set up safe, which normally I would just, you know, point out where it is in the manual while we're doing it, but I don't actually know where it is now. And yeah, so we'll just, we'll just do what we're gonna do the normal way. Okay, so at this point, we can't go any further because we need forward programming, which is only gonna work once we have connected because that's all done through telemetry. Okay, so throttle cuts on. We have no flaps to worry about and our trim should still be centered, clearing our timer. Oh, actually, let's do that too. Let's set up a, let's set up a timer. Let's just set it up for five minutes. And we won't need this because we'll have smart telemetry. Okay, so we're gonna turn that on for five minutes. And then we're gonna do a voice at one. And then a voice for a countdown at 10. And then expiration is gonna be tone and vibrate in a tone every minute thereafter. Okay, so when we pass over 25%, it starts the countdown. Okay, we can cancel the clear, throttle cuts on, switches in the middle, everything else is ready to go. So now we can go ahead and get this thing bound up, which should be super easy in terms of the process. So let's do this right now. Now keep in mind, our stuff is not all plugged in, as in we don't have our uh, control arms attached. So where does, this, where does this all go? It goes over here. Trying to figure out the best way to hold this. I believe sitting upside down is probably the only way that's gonna make sense. And I know that this is fairly close to the front, okay? So I do see that they have a strap that is through the aircraft. That's kind of nice. 
but it's just kind of like in a weird, what the heck is going on with that? They have it rolled up. That's very strange. Okay, so I don't know if I have my Velcro on the right spot or the wrong spot, but I'm just gonna go with, it's probably fine either way. And I can't tell if this slides through. It does slide through, good. Okay, so I'm just gonna stick that down onto the battery. And I'm trying not to push too hard, but in order to kind of hold and fasten everything, you do need to push a certain amount of hardness or it's like gonna pop off while you're flying. So just use your best judgment. But again, I'm just gonna point this out to you. As you're attaching that, you really don't have anything super strong to hold on to, you see, because that's foam. It's got limited amount of strength. Now also I wanna be careful because if this were to start, I need to secure the aircraft. Obviously taking the prop off is the best idea. My throttle cut is on, it's not bound though, so it shouldn't do anything but I'm still gonna err on the side of it's gonna be having a mechanical problem and it starts up and then my hands are in a safe spot in case it does. Okay, so I see two, so we're gonna plug that in. We should expect to see no activity on the aircraft. We're gonna listen, hasn't started yet. Now I'm gonna look on the side, there's no flashing light. I'm gonna press for a second, it's gonna come up with that. Then I'm gonna just click and scroll down to bind. You'll note that my, aunt, my arm and wrist are in a safe spot. I'm gonna click bind. Scroll to yes, click bind. Okay. S securing the aircraft. Okay, good, so we're bound. We see movement, we see movement, we see movement, good. Throttle cut is off. Throttle, going the correct direction, throttle cut's on. Okay, so far everything's safe. I am confident that I can handle this aircraft safely now. Okay, so now what we need to do is center our servos uh, so we can do that real super simple. I'm gonna clear my timer real quick and then we're just gonna hold the servo, see this? Or we're gonna hold the control surface flat and we're gonna see where we go. Now we wanna be in the outside hole and we're way off. So I can just brace this with my fingers and then spin this, it spins really easy actually. So that's probably like five or six or seven turns. Hold this flat, yeah, not even close. At least it's easy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these things are so hard to spin. Ooh, that's pretty good. Half a turn too far maybe? Let's try. Super easy. Now you can tell that's notably up. So definitely not acceptable. Probably one and a half turns. Let's see how that looks now. And I feel like that's still high. You wanna grab onto that and just show the people what I'm talking about? Well, that's pretty close though, mm. a little bit. Eh, I think I need another half a turn out. Mm -hmm. Let's try it. You might be right though. Yeah, that's good, better. You gotta be picky here because this is what's gonna make the difference, okay? So now we'll go over to the other side, which means I need to spin the aircraft. Sorry, crew. Mm -hmm. mm, okay, so holding that in position, this one's super close. Probably need to come out just like half a turn, maybe another half a turn. Half a turn more yet, half a turn more. So that was about five. Okay, there it's ultra fine thread. So there's very small adjustments, super finite. That's too high, need to go out more. Goodness gracious, it's so weird. It feels like, okay, that's about right, I would say. And then I'm just gonna slide this tube down and that tube will help keep it from coming undone. Okay, so now ailerons, roll left, Jeez. roll right. <laughs> Yeah, right, it's crazy, isn't it? Now here's the crazy thing, high rates, and there's our low rates. Okay, wow. there's elevator is the next one. So the elevator's a little bit harder to line up than the other two surfaces, just because there's a small amount of horizontal stabilizer and a large amount of, large amount of elevator. So if you wanna show them from that side, I'm just grabbing here and pinching it level, okay? And then I'm basically just gonna, I have to turn this in just like we did before, but I have to brace it. There is definitely a helicopter out there. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it is though. It's really close. Like right over us. Let's see if we can find it. Is it out here? Let's look. Turn on. Where are they? Right there. Oh, cool. So, sorry guys, when we see aircraft on Brian Phillips RC. I knew that was loud. We stopped the video because that's what we do. And also, 
once they've seen that for a second, show them the moon. It looks super cool. I knew there was there were, had to be something going on. Yeah. You notice only one has their anti crash beacon on. Mm-hmm. That's pretty cool. Okay, show them the moon now. Oh, cool! Oh, it's so pretty. I'm zoomed in a bunch. You can yeah. zoom out. Sorry about that, camera crew. I know that was a pain. It was a little chilly out here. Yeah. I thought you were going to show them the other thing. Tidbit nipply. What other thing? The other oh, thing that you thing. You have to go take care of later. No, oh. we're not showing that. I'm okay. kidding. Okay, great. So this is square. Ooh. And so now I need to keep running this in further. Goodness gracious, I'm gonna be like right at the end of that adjustment. Are you at yeah, the outside that's good. hole on that one too? Yeah, I think so. They're lined up almost the same. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I'm happy with that. Okay, so now elevator. And then rudder is not lined up. Show them the rudder. This needs to be lined up and it's mm -hmm. not, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'll just slide this forward, pop this out. Which way does that go? Down, down, right? Up, I can't tell. Goodness gracious. You would think it'd be super easy to pop out, but it's evidently not. Mm -mm. Okay, I guess I need a screwdriver. Okay, so it's like rubbery enough that it's like impossible. I don't really understand. There we go. Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna center this rudder and I can tell that I need to go in quite a bit. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever, whatever that is. Okay, a little bit more. Okay, I think we're probably good there. Let's try that. Show the people from above. Oh yeah, it's all better. Yeah, way, way more straighters. <laughs> Proper English as a second language. There's a lot of weirdness just, going on there. Looks. Okay, so now throttle cuts off. Okay, all right. So now the next thing we need to do is do forward programming. So if you wanna, Throttle cuts on and tested. You want to sit here with me or whatever? We can clear the timer. Whoa, it says SD. Interesting. Look at that. Oh. I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. Probably like it's connected to the SD card. That's pretty cool. So click. Forward programming. Gyro settings. Save select. Okay, so. Looks like it's already got a flight mode set up with this channel on the gear channel. So that's super easy. So with this switch toward me, I want safe on. So I'm gonna turn it on. Now safe is on. Now safe is off. And just to be clear, you can turn AS3X off because there are three modes available. I just happen to only be calling out two because A only has two positions. So if I wanted, I could go to switch B and I could have AS3X on, AS3X off, safe on, or some combination there, okay? So now what I have to do to get this to work is to walk all the way out and go to servo setup, travel, reverse gear. Now, safe will be off. AS3X will be on in this condition, which is normal. And then safe will be on here, okay? So throttle cuts on, safe is currently on. So as you can see, when you flip the plane on its belly or on its back, it's gonna find the quickest route to level. But I do find it a little bit strange that the elevator's not actuating at all. See that? I think it's because when you're at halfway, the elevator's like, I guess you have to take some special action with that. So that's kind of weird. Okay, so throttle cut is currently on. Safe is off. I'm gonna give some throttle and we're gonna see, this thing should easily float or hammerhead. Okay, so throttle cuts off. As you can see, there's tons of authority and that's 59% throttle. There's about 42% throttle. You can definitely see it has <laughs> lots of action to it. It's resisting the movements. See the elevator? 
It's really trying to resist. It's trying to resist my rot rotary axis. The rudder is working to resist the axis. I just didn't know if I'd be able to hammerhead the thing in the living room. Um, I probably could, but I'm just not 100% sure. I definitely don't want to crash it. Takes a little more power than I figured. So it's definitely, it's got plenty of power to float. It's just a matter of, are we gonna do that or not? I don't think I wanna do it out, I, I don't wanna do it in here just for the simple fact that I don't wanna break it. Also, let's look at telemetry while we're in here. You can definitely see your voltage, you can see that, and you can see your individual cell counts, which is really nice. You can see as it balances. Let's see what it looks like under load. Throttle cuts off. Boy, that's, that's like a lot of load mm -hmm. for a little battery. But look how good it stays balanced, that's yeah. pretty good. Now that, I've always, I've often thought that that was kind of like a, a BS screen, but there are times when I've had cells that are off and they'll sag on the top end of the range, especially in EDF jets. So I don't know, maybe it is BS, I'm not sure. But it's a 4.05 now. So it's quite windy out there, or I would be super tempted to take it out and actually show what this thing can do right now. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be a good boy and not do that stupid thing right now. But for now, the erratic, the erratic 3D is right here on Brian Phillips RC. If you wanna help support us, we're doing these long format videos to try to help you guys get started in the hobby or maybe get back into the hobby and help prevent one and dones which is where people of course buy a plane that's too much for them and they end up crashing it almost immediately and totaling a very expensive plane. Now, of course, this isn't a very expensive plane. Um, and if you think it is very expensive, just wait longer. I must say, um, it looks like it's gonna be a pretty robust plane. It's gonna hold up well because it's so light. It's not gonna get tons of damage. And I know some of you guys are probably wondering, is that sub 250? And the answer to that question is I don't think so. And we can just talk about this for a second, just so you guys don't have the curiosity in your head. We've got our scale coming on. It's at zero grams right now. Let's see how it's, if I can set it on here. I may have to kind of balance it here, folks. Yeah, we're well over. So we're about like, what are we like? Uh, 395 grams, let's call it. So you're well over the 250 gram uh, offering. So unless you were to put a super duper dinky pack in there, you're not gonna get this thing sub 250, just so you know, for what it's worth. So that being said, we really appreciate you guys watching these long format videos, and hopefully we've answered a few of your questions, but I do wanna address one other thing. Thrust reverse is a question that I have on this plane. It may not be as critical just because of the nature of the type of flying you would do with it, but it would be cool to have it. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're gonna set up thrust reverse. If it lets us, I might have to put a charged battery in there first. Throttle cut is on. Disconnect the battery first, then reconnect the battery. Then after the startup, low throttle, throttle cuts on, up elevator, left aileron. Sweet. Okay, so use your ailerons and ailerons and elevator to make the changes. So brake, disabled, normal, proportional, reverse. Yes, you're probably supposed to set up some brake force, but yeah, I'm just gonna leave it at zero. So there's Ryzen. They want it to be like a seven or something and it prepares the motor to go reverse. So what happens is there's a little bit of braking that's applied in between the changeover. What that's gonna do is it's going to help the ESC get ready for everything, okay? Sorry, she's talking. Okay, so thrust reverse. 
This is channel five, this would be channel six. So currently, I guess channel seven's fine. So we already have it on channel seven. So I'm gonna save with exit. Okay, I'm gonna just protect myself by holding. And then it just reboots the airplanes, no big deal. Okay, so now when we actuate uh, channel seven, it's gonna set up thrust reverse for us. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll this here into a spot where we can be safe and also gain control of the plane quick. And I'm gonna clear my timer. Actually, I'm gonna jog over here and just see what auxiliary, that's auxiliary six, right? So this would be, nope, that's not set up yet. And that's not set up yet. So I have to make an association. So we're gonna go to system setup, disconnect RF, go to the uh, channel assign, auxiliary, uh, it's on switch B. Okay, I'm gonna set it to switch G. Switch G is right here. How do you tell? Because it says right there. G, this is H, and this is R knob. Okay, so I want G. Why G? You're like, Brian, you don't even have retracts. Why are you using switch G for God's sake? Well, the reason I'm using G for God's sake is because this one would be for gear, it's for safe. This one would be for flaps, but I don't have flaps, and so I don't want to use that up. I want to keep my muscle memory intact. This would be for safe select or AS3X, depending on if I have retracts but I'm gonna go ahead and leave it there. C would be unused. It's usually used for something weird like a Vario on off, uh, just the audio ability. The bind button would be used for panic if we even had it, but like you're gonna get to that to panic, give me a break. You'd be better off to set it to your gear or something like that. E we never use. F we use for our Expo and dual rates and of course throttle cut. Right knob is used for master gains on plug and fly planes or plug and play flames, planes. So we're gonna use switch G because that's what we're used to. So how do we set that up? We just go into the digital switch setup. Well, actually we can go into the digital switch setup, but what I'd prefer to do is go into the monitor to show you how it's gonna work. Okay, so now this is attached to auxiliary two. So channel one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so that's gonna make forward thrust, I believe. So throttle cut is off, bracing the plane. That's forward thrust, as you can see, it's wanting to go away from me. And that's reverse thrust. See the flowers? Moving? Okay, cool. So now what have we learned from that? Throttle cuts on. This position is reverse thrust, so I wanna make that function backward, okay? So what do we do? We go to digital switch setup. We're gonna select the switch, switch G. And in our neutral setting, I want that to be minus 100 because that's what I want to be using to go forward. So meaning my neutral setting is what I have set by default when I first turn on the aircraft. And then I want this setting to be reverse thrust and this setting to also be reverse thrust. We're not gonna ever set up pilot fatigue on reverse set, uh, reverse throttle, uh, reverse thrust rather, prop, tractor prop, no less planes because it's just, could be dangerous. And that's part of the reason why they don't mention it in the manual, I think, but that's warnings. Well, that's Whoa. interesting. Um, okay, well, I guess I'm gonna go back into digital switch setup and I'm gonna go back to switch G and it looks like it interrupted us probably for like a voltage warning, I'm guessing. So there's a hundred and then I wanna change this to also plus 100. That was cool that, that was it changed colors. And it also didn't beep like ridiculously obnoxious. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're gonna test something. I wanna, whoops, sorry. 50. They did add a decibel of precision there. I, I don't believe that was two before. Okay, throttle cuts off. Okay, we have reverse thrust and reverse thrust. And we go back to forward thrust. Throttle cuts on, throttle sticks down. Okay, so we've set up Thrust reverse, and just to prove it to you, because it's kind of hard to see on camera, I'm gonna go throttle cuts off. We've got forward thrust, edging forward. We've got reverse thrust, edging backward. So then that should give you the ability to do some extraordinary and additionally strange 3D maneuvers. But just to be clear, just because this is a 3D plane does not mean you have to fly a flat foam plane in a 3D fashion. Some of you guys might not be into 3D flying. You can definitely fly these 
in a different way. Now, I must say, I've been disappointed in the selection of flat foam planes that are bind and fly because I don't have time to build them. When I first got into the hobby, my main attraction to flat foam was quick and dirty, get something built, hot glue that sucker together, get it flying, have fun. And usually you ended up with like a super loud prop and it was really fun. And I remember not in our current living room, but in our old living room where we used to live, I had a MiG-29 or something like that that my friend got for me in some random cell phone shop at the Mall of America. And it was super cool. And people asked a million times, where can I buy that thing? Well, of course, I couldn't really answer because it was some place that my friend got it. Uh, but it was really fun. And we just hog glued it together. It was like the ugliest plane ever by the time we had played with it a lot because we were just crashing them like crazy and having all sorts of fun. We had a little stabilizer in it and, and it was a lot of work to set up actually by the time it was all said and done. This thing is not a lot of work to set up. The hardest part is the fact that the screwdriver didn't like to agree with the screw hole. Okay, so big whoop, not a big deal. We had six screws to put in this. You can definitely take this thing apart if you wanted to, but I would not want to have to do that every time to be frank. Um, you know, it just kind of is what it is. I think this thing would go together if you had to take it apart. Maybe if you had a small, 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 like really small. How would you have a car that's so small you couldn't <laughs> put this thing in? You're not going to fit in it. If you, I was, you can't get your human body in there. But that being said, if you are going to be flying this thing and you wanted to take it apart, I don't know why you would, you could take off one wing and you would have one linkage to undo. It wouldn't be that big a deal. Oh, and then of course you'd have to undo this clip and you could just like fold that over to the other side possibly. Yeah. But I don't know. All I'm going to say is we don't have that problem, so I don't have any good ex explanation for you other than this thing should fit in the car with you. And then also the longest axis on it is actually the length axis, which mm -hmm. is somewhat unusual. Usually the wingspan is really considerably similar to the length, but you tend to find that. And why is that camera crew? For on a 3D plane for stability, right? It's because you have a longer, you have a longer lever arm. Oh. to make those crazy maneuvers happen. Oh, okay. So I'm super excited to try some cornholes with this thing and hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. So give it a thumbs up if you haven't already and definitely come back for more on Brian Phillips RC. We have tons of footage coming. And uh, the other thing too is if you're wanting to support us but maybe you just hate flat foam, you can always do Patreon or PayPal. We have that in the links in the video description below. Of course, the fee structure on Patreon is really high. PayPal, there's still some fees involved which is ridiculous. Everybody's gotta get theirs. And then did we set up super thanks? We're working on, we're super working thanks. on super thanks. Yep. Super thanks is one of these things that people have been asking for. It's just what, like whatever easy way it is for people to help support us. We appreciate you guys. We have an awesome, super supportive audience here on Brian Phillips RC. If you're new to the audience, um, we were resistant to do PayPal and Patreon for years. Uh, but really all we always asked people was like, Hey, if you like the plane buy the plane, because that helps us to build clout with these manufacturers as we bring things before you. And then that also helps us to make small commissions from the companies that sell these things. So you guys don't actually pay for it. It's really nice. It's on the back end. It's totally aside from you. You get your RC bucks, you get your credit card, you know, miles or whatever it is you accumulate. And then if you're part of a program like Horizon Hobby has their uh, program where you get points and things like that, you get all that stuff just like normal. They just happen to know that we sent you to buy it as opposed to just stumbling onto it. Or maybe you had saw a few other people review this and you're like, I'm not sure. I want to see what Brian has to say. That's what we do, okay? So hopefully we can help you in that regard, making a decision between this and that, because we do tend to be, um, let's just say it this way, I'm not good at faking it. I, I either love it or I don't love it, and you can usually tell. So, and you have lots of basis for comparison because we've done thousands of videos like this, and we hope you guys enjoy them. Um, we're not real good at um, brevity here though. So that's what Fast Forward works for. And if not, honestly, most people are watching the flights and we get that. The small group of people that really need some help setting up radios is who come to the Unbox Build radio setup. And so if you guys are watching this and you're new to the hobby, uh, don't feel like anybody's trying to abandon you. It's just that this part, once you learn it, it's quite easy. And so that's why we keep doing it. And if you guys don't want to watch it for the 500th time, we get it. Uh, but at the end of the day, the biggest and most critical tool in your tool bag is going to be your transmitter as an RC pilot. And you ought to get to know how to use this thing inside and out. So it's quite easy once you get started. You could probably watch three or four RC videos, um, you know, just doing the radio setup and you probably not need to watch again. But the thing is, there's always new people coming into the fold and that's what we do. And we specialize uh, with here on Prime Phillips RC. But we also don't know what planes you're going to be getting. 
And a lot of people come back years later asking us questions. So that's what we do. So hopefully we helped you out a little bit. And if you smash the like button, you'll help us back. And uh, like I said, the best way you can help us financially is if you buy these wonderful aircraft. And we have done a plethora. I mean, literally every type of aircraft you can, you can think of, we've pretty much done or will be doing soon. And then also, if you have questions about transmitters and things like that, we're getting ready to maybe jump up to the 10. We've been recommending the eight for a long time because we've only ran into three conditions. And I'm talking about three planes out of probably 150, maybe 200 probably. if you include the little you know, ready to fly apparatus that we, we reviewed in the helicopters and things like that. Um, so maybe, maybe 250 aircraft. Um, we've been using the NX-8 for most of them and we really, really like the NX-8. Prior to that, we were on the NX-6, which actually have a seventh channel, but I would stay, I would stay away from that because for a few bucks more, you can buy so many more models worth of use. And the thing is, but between you and me, if you buy the NX-6 and then later you buy the NX-8, my suggestion would be instead just save a couple bucks, find somebody that's, that's moving on, get the NX-6 from them, and then move into an NX-8 or an NX-10 when you've got the budget for it because it's not that much more money. I mean, going from the, from the 8 to the 10 is a, a, a little bit bigger bump, but it's not a huge bump. It's like, you know, 70, 80 bucks more. And one thing you're going to find too, I just want to point this out. This is something I don't point out often but I have answered it on comments, questions. You see that? That's a bigger battery, 3.7 uh, volts, but this one's a 6,000 milliamp hour. The ones that come in, this is a singular cell. This is three cells, okay? So the singular cell is only gonna be a 2,000 milliamp hour battery, and that's one of the big advantages you get out of the box with the NX-10. Plus you get the Hall effects uh, gimbals. And so I, I spoke about this earlier in the video. And so if you're not sure the context of this, it's okay. Most people don't know the context uh, because it's not overly public. But the thing is, we're trying to decide between going into the 10 or going to the 14. And we're just afraid of leaving people in the dust that might be into the NX line. And we feel like more people are going to be driven to the NX line because it's really honestly, the NX 10 is going to buy you years and years and years of use. And you're going to cover like pretty much every model that comes out. But if you go over to the 14, then we can dig into some of the more complex setups and do it with the new Android system, which is slightly different. It definitely has a different twist on things. So we're really honestly racking our brains right now, trying to decide which direction we wanna go. Uh, but at this point, maybe leave it in the comments below. Let us know what you think, because honestly, we, we don't ever really mean to leave people in the dust. When we went from the six to the eight, I felt bad because I knew there was people that were like, hey, I'm gonna get the six because you said it was good. It was good. And the thing is, we ran out of channels pretty quick on that. And we knew that going in. And I think we mentioned it quite a bit, you know, that you may run out of channels, but we had safe select on that. You could still do safe because you have the seventh channel. Well, the thing is, it's not a full proportional channel. And we always knew that going in. But then we went into the eight and we just haven't run into a landmine until the P47 from Hangar 9. Mm -hmm. That was the first time. And then we did probably another 40 planes after that before we ran into the next one, which yep. was that one right there. Yep. What's the other There's one? There's one other one though, because there the was hangar? one between- No, not the Hangar 9, mm -hmm. the PT-19 we didn't have problems with because- There was one between the F-16 and the P-47. Hmm. There's been one other one. I can't remember off top of my head. But the thing is, the other cool so, thing is, guys, if you think about it with the AV and ESCs, even with differential thrust, you don't have to waste a channel on it because the AV and hmm. ESC handles it. So it's super cool. We're getting so much awesome technology and so many answers. Uh, to prayers, questions, and complaints, whichever way you want to look at it, to these <laughs> manufacturers in recent history. So really, and, and it just, just happens to come on the heels of a worldwide pandemic. And uh, so that's unfortunate because then that means inflation is really kicking our butt. So that means stuff is getting expensive. And that's my closing statement for you is if you like something, don't wait to buy it because supply chain sucks and inflation sucks worse. And so really at the end of the day, if you're wanting to get this and you wanna to try to get it on sale or whatever, maybe you're rolling the dice because you never know when stuff like this is gonna go up and you may hear me grumble about these things from time to time. We never talk about price because it changes so fast anymore. If you like a plane, buy it when you see it, buy it when it's in stock. Yep. Don't wait for a better deal because there's a good chance it's not gonna be a better deal. It's gonna be a worse deal. Or, and, and then we have to come out and say, oh look, it's new color and it costs 40 bucks more or some stupid thing like that, which we hate to do. And even if it's not in stock, you might wanna back order at the price that it's at. Or early. 
or early. Oh, by the way, speaking of these, if you're super excited about this, and I know some of you guys are gonna be super excited about this, they are getting a container. When you see this video, at the time you're seeing this video, they're gonna have containers ready to ship within days, like one or two days. So if you want this thing in your hangar or in your garage or wherever you put it in, in the Miata with you, <laughs> you know who I'm talking to. In the Miata with you, then definitely order it soon. If you pre-order this one, you'll be getting them quick if you're quick to order. Of course, if you wait and you drag your feet, you're probably gonna be in the second container. But that being said, you notice how big the box was? Yeah. I was amazed. I thought this thing would be a dinky box, but it's actually a big box. And you know why? Because you don't have to assemble much of it. put together. Yep. Which is, which is the way I like it. Yep. So thank you, Horizon, for that. And without further ado, we're gonna wrap this thing up, guys. We really appreciate you. You've been super good to us. It's been huge, all the support you've given us <laughs> on this channel, and we appreciate it. We know support because we get it from <laughs> you. <laughs> so stay tuned and come back for more on Brian Phillips RC. And if you haven't checked it out, www.brianphillipsrc.com. It's your one-stop shop for whatever the coupon code of the day is. We try to keep them up to date. And if they're not there, then it's possible they don't exist or we just don't have it yet. But that being said, we appreciate you. And you can also follow the links from there back to the videos here and you can watch and organize and figure out what you wanna compare and contrast and then make purchase decisions there. So Christmas is coming, don't forget. Stay tuned so much more from Brian Phillips RC.